Good morning. Uh, my name is Darren Clavo. I'm the state fire meteorologist for South Dakota. And I'm also on the board for operational government meteorologists with the uh, AMS. And I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar this morning. We have a distinguished list of panelists uh, that are going to talk about uh, work-life balance and women in meteorology. Uh, we have Jamie Betcher. She's a research assistant for students. We have Captain Dempsey, who's joining us via phone from a ship somewhere out in the ocean. Um, we have Karen Hatfield, who's a meteorologist from the NWS Tulsa. We have Aisha Wilkinson from NWS Cheyenne. And we have Jennifer Stark, uh, who's the meteorologist in charge at the NWS office in Boulder. Our moderator today is gonna to be Dr. Michelle Hawkins. Dr. Hawkins, thank you so much for moderating this discussion. And uh, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, and, um, and I just really appreciate all our panelists being able to join. This should be just a fantastic discussion. So thank you once again. Thank you, Darren, and, and thanks to everyone who has taken the time out of their day to join us on, in this really important discussion. Um, so we're gonna jump right in and just to orient you to uh, our discussion today, um, I'm gonna ask the, the panelists to take uh, three, no more than five minutes to just tell us about themselves, share their background, how what brought them to meteorology, and then uh, what they do in their day job now. Um, and then I have a few targeted questions that I'll ask the panelists, um, and then we'll take audience questions. So uh, we're going to start with Aisha. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Aisha Wilkinson. I'm a meteorologist at the National Weather Service in Cheyenne. So what my day-to-day -day looks like is more forecasting, um, learning tools and tips to integrate weather models and forecast information for uh, DSS impact-based warnings and things like that. Um, so that's kind of what I do day-to-day. -day. I also am uh, the chair-elect for BRAID. Um, so I'm really looking forward to this panel and thank you for inviting me. And Jennifer? Hi, I'm Jennifer. I am coming up on my 28th year in the National Weather Service, and I've been um, in meteorology since I was a student. I was actually hired as a student, and I worked at the office in Cheyenne. Then I went to Des Moines, Iowa, and then I was back in Cheyenne as a general forecaster and then a lead. Then I was the warning coordination meteorologist in Topeka, Kansas, the MIC in Pueblo, Colorado, and now the MIC in Boulder. And um, I really was drawn to meteorology because I had an interest in aviation and I started out in a pilot program and did some uh, training flying and I got my private pilot's license, but it's really expensive to fly and they don't give you student loans for flying. So at the same time, I took a weather for aviators class and I loved it. So I transferred and became a meteorology student instead. Thanks. All right, Karen. Hello, um, my name is Karen Hatfield and um, I'm a meteorologist at the National Weather Service in Tulsa. Um, I have been in the weather service for 21 years now. Um, like Jennifer, I started as a student. I was a skep um, in Norman for four years while getting my bachelor's and my master's degree. Um, converted to become an intern for a few months there in Norman and then took my first forecaster job at the uh, weather service in Chanhassen, Minnesota. Way outside my comfort zone. <laughs> But I learned a lot there. And then I came back down south to Tulsa, where I've been for about 13, it'll be 13 years in um, October now. So um, I have wanted to be a meteorologist for as long as I can remember. I mean, I was, I was one of those that I was six. Um, I grew up in the Texas Panhandle, so I was no stranger to severe weather, which is obviously why I'm kind of drawn to the Southern Plains here. Um, but basically when I was six, I thought tornadoes were cool, but I was scared of them. So I wanted to learn more about it. And, uh, so obviously severe weather is one of my passions. Um, I'm very excited to kind of talk to you about, you know, how I, I deal with being a shift worker and being a mom. I have two kids, a 10 year old boy named Andrew, 
and an eight-year-old girl named, wait for it, Camille. Uh, obviously, very strategic. So um, thank you very much for including me. Thanks, Karen. Jamie? Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. And it's an honor to be with this group of ladies today. I started, and this is very humbling, I realized that I'm a little over 40 years from earning my bachelor's degree at OU, which was how I got started growing up in Oklahoma. And like so many of us, I had a tornado trauma when I was a child. Um, I did choose meteorology completely naively. I didn't think I was smart enough to be a scientist. I'm still struggling with that at times. Um, but I succeeded academically, what, what I would call through grit and fear of failure. I was in National Weather Service operations for about 10 years. Um, decided to go into teaching and I actually left to get my master's degree in math, but um, at that time, the next Nextherd program was coming online. So I moved into training for the rest of my weather service career, which staged me perfectly for going into research at the laboratory because I worked with the uh, scientists for the training that I did. So um, I feel like I've come full circle. And I'm delighted to be here and to share whatever I can share that's worthwhile. Thank you. And Captain Dempsey. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, please uh, call me Rachel. Um, it's really uh, awesome to uh, be invited to participate in this panel today. Uh, though I really feel as though uh, I'm a little bit out of place with uh, all these uh, awesome professional meteorologists. Um, I kind of fell into the meteorology community. Uh, my desire uh, when I went into college to be a commissioned officer in the Navy as an oceanographer. So uh, I completed my bachelor's degree down in Jacksonville, Florida in marine science. I took every physical oceanography course that was, uh, was available to me. And I uh, received my commission as a direct profession into the oceanography community, which is not a common thing, but I was very excited about that. And I was very good that I got to uh, my basic training course as I learned that uh, uh, the my community actually does more meteorology than oceanography. And so uh, I did feet in feet first and, and learn uh, very quickly what it was to be a meteorologist. So I earned my forecast qualification at the Island in Washington uh, and completed uh, a master's degree in meteorology and physical and oceanography uh, in the Naval Postgraduate School a couple years later. And, uh, had an opportunity to uh, serve a variety of operational meteorology positions, uh, both at sea uh, and ashore, uh, through the Atlantic, the Mediterranean, the Arabian Sea. Um, I've served as a forward oceanographer and meteorologist uh, in support of combined joint task force for of Africa, which is in Djibouti, Africa. Um, and as a senior officer, uh, I was responsible for providing resource protection, meteorological support, as well as um, deployable oceanographic teams uh, throughout the Pacific while in command of naval oceanography and to submarine warfare command in the coast of Japan. Uh, as commanding officer of Fleet Hunter Center San Diego a few years later, uh, I led naval meteorology and oceanography support at both the shore and afloat all of the Air Force, Coast Guard, and coalition partners. Uh, afloat throughout the Pacific and Middle Eastern areas of operation. Uh, that also included uh, oversight of the Joint Hurricane Warning Center, which is kind of the, the Navy's equivalent of the National Hurricane Center. We look at everything from where uh, National Hurricane Center ends out in, uh, in the Eastern Pacific and out to where we operate throughout the West Pac, the IO, uh, Bay Um In the start of the Navy, uh, information Warfare uh, Construct. I'm now serving a float uh, as the Information Warfare Commander for the USS Eisenhower Carrier Strike Group. Uh, I think we have a, a brief moment of respite. We've been conducting flight ops, so it's finally gotten quiet again, so I apologize in advance for the noise. Uh, my responsibilities now include application of intelligence technology, information operations, uh, electromagnetic warfare, communications, and of course, environmental support, which includes meteorology and oceanography. Uh, the entire strike group, which consists of the aircraft carrier, Eisenhower, uh, our air wing, 
uh, two uh, cruisers and four destroyers. And uh, so it's it's a pretty exciting time for me. I am um, I'm married. I have two kids. Uh, they don't have great hurricane names, <laughs> um, but uh, my kids are older than 12, and I had uh, was able to uh, accomplish that goal while I was uh, on one of my my few uh, shore duty stations. So uh, again, really excited to be here and happy to answer any questions anybody has. Thank you. All right, great. And so just to complete the list, I'm Michelle. <laughs> I um, graduated from Howard University. I have both of my degrees there, for, um, bachelor's in uh, chemistry and then the PhD in atmospheric sciences. Um, my grad school work, um, we studied Saharan dust and its transport across the Atlantic Ocean. I was fortunate to go out on a number of NOAA ship cruises to um, uh, study the, the dust, we would sail into the mouth of the storm, so to say, and collect all types of samples, launch weather balloons and ozone sands off the backs of ships. Um, and that was fun. And then um, got my degree and went to work at NOAA first in uh, climate um, in our climate services branch. And then um, in the position that I am now. So I've been at NOAA for about, well, NOAA, I think about 12 13 years, maybe 14. I've stopped counting. <laughs> All right. So, um, like I said, I have a couple of targeted questions for the uh, panelists here, and then we'll take audience questions. So, please use the chat feature to submit your questions, um, and then I'll read them off for the panelists. So, to start, um, if you knew what you know now, um, what would you tell your younger self, like your younger, just taking on your first job, younger self, what would you tell that person about work-life balance? And we'll start with Aisha. Uh, so now that I know that COVID's a thing, um, because my first job was entering the weather service during COVID peak um, April, um, so I moved across country from all the way from the East Coast to the High Plains that I've never been in Colorado before. I've never been in Wyoming before. So this is a complete shocker. Um, so the one thing I would tell my younger self, um, I would tell myself that I think that there is no truly work-life balance. I think people like kind of want to convince themselves there is, but there's probably not. So you're you're gonna have to prioritize what you really want to put first. Um, and that's what I would tell myself. Cause I used to think, oh, I can just do it all, right? I can just go to sleep and wake up and hang out with friends, talk to everyone. It's fine but you can't. So you have to kind of prioritize, make sure you prioritize what parts you need each week. And it's going to change. It's going to change all the time. It's, it's going to change from prioritizing emails to events to uh, extra activities that you want to do with friends to, well, I really need to be on my work schedule right now. I really need to focus on this right now, professional development. Um, so that's one thing I would tell myself that there's no real truly work-life balance. It's more like prioritizing what comes first, what you really need to be doing first. Thanks. Jennifer, what would you tell your younger self? Well, I think work-life balance has been a struggle throughout my career. I, you know, I'm still not good at it. But if I could go back and tell my younger self, I would, um, you know, remind myself how hard shift work is on a person. That you really have to prioritize your health. And that means getting the sleep that you need so you can perform at your best on midnight shifts and things like that. Um, and also taking care of yourself first, it allows you to be a better employee, allows you to be a better mother, wife, when you're away from work. So I think that's one of the things that I would do. I really was able to become more disciplined about keeping a strict sleep schedule when I had two little kids and I was working shift work and I had to take them to daycare because my husband was also working. So that was the point where I really learned to be disciplined about 
disciplined about taking care of myself and getting the sleep that I needed. That's great. That's along the lines of what they tell you on the airplane. Put your mask on first, right? <laughs> uh, Karen. Well, the first one of these, I think Aisha kind of touched on. I have a couple of notes here. Um, but one of the things that kind of the, I guess, the elder statesman in the agency I've heard say, you know, a few times is that when it comes to the shift work, you knew what you were getting into when you got into it. I would contend that that is not true because your idea and your attempts at work-life balance change as your circumstances change. So the person that I was 21 years ago when I got into this agency, I was single, I had no kids, um, you know, didn't have a dog, didn't have to worry about really anything but myself, you know, and, and those things completely different than having to deal with having a husband, having two children, um, you know, having more family through getting married. And so, you know, your idea of how well and how prepared you are to handle shift work when you get older and you have these additional responsibilities, it, it's going to change through that time frame. So you need to like be prepared that it's going to change and be willing to be flexible, which with my personality type, I have I struggle with that. So um, it's something that I've had to learn. The second thing, and this is another thing that I'm still learning, is that whether it's in your personal life or whether it's in your work life, do not be afraid to say no. And don't feel guilty about it if you truly need it. Um, again, my personality type, it's, it's really hard for me to, you know, disappoint people because I feel like I'm disappointing them. Um, but if you truly need it for your own self-care, do not be afraid to say no and then just let it go. Don't dwell on it. That's great advice. Jamie? Boy, my younger self. I had to think a while on that one. Um, but I would tell her that she has a right and a duty to present herself as a whole person. One of the things I have been struck by, I, I always have presented myself as just a worker, mostly. Um, one of the things I've been struck by throughout my career is how stuck we still are in this culture that while we're at work, somebody else seems to be taking care of the rest of our lives. And that's not going to change unless we change it. And I've changed a lot in the last 10 years, I would say, in that regard. But I wish I'd had an earlier start. Thanks for that. And Rachel? Um, so I, I would uh, tell myself to be patient. Um, not everything needs to happen immediately. Uh, I was, I, my younger self is very, very driven, uh, and I saw everything that I needed to do, and I felt like I needed to do it all at once. And that's not how life works. And you drive yourself into the ground if you if you try to uh, to follow that path. So that was what I would say would be the first thing I tell myself is is be patient. Uh, second, goes along the same lines as many of the other uh, panelists have said, um, know your priorities. Uh, and and uh, they're going to be, you need to understand the balance, you know, where your priorities are between work and your personal life. Because you are human. You're more than who you are at work. Um, who you are is going to evolve. Uh, and you need to understand that and, and embrace it. And finally, uh, I'd say be kind to yourself. Um, own your choices. Things don't always happen as you plan them. Um, but if you remember to be patient and you remember uh, to know your priorities, um, then you know all these things will. You know, you'll you'll give yourself a good foundation from which to to at least manage uh, that those those priorities you need to you need to juggle uh, throughout your life. 
Thanks for that. And I think juggle is a really good word to use in this forum. Um, so the other thing, um, and I want to ask you all, given that this past year has been a, an interesting and difficult one to say the least, um, how have you had to reinvent what work-life balance means for you? Um, so we'll start again with Aisha. So um, I'll speak on like a kind of an early career standpoint. Um, so with kind of this work-life balance, um, it's kind of like coming home and it's not turning off as quickly um, or you're teleworking and it's not turning off as quickly because almost now at this point in time, my living room has become like the National Weather Service <laughs> almost. Um, I hate to say that, but it's true. <laughs> Um, so it's it's kind of just blended all in together, which is a little bit unhealthy. Um, I feel like now everyone in the AMS community and National Weather Service knows that's Aisha's living room. They they just know it now because this is what it is. This is how it's been. Um, so it's it's been hard setting boundaries. Going okay, I'm not going to do um, this meeting in my room i'm not going to do this in the hallway i'm not go i'm going to do this at this spot i'm going to conduct my workflow in this area all day i won't you know move rooms and and i know it's harder for people who have kids who who already have families and i know that's already tough balancing that um just from an early career standpoint um, it kind of sucks when you're home all day um, and then you e either you telework and you're still here or and you don't have anyone else unless you have a partner. So you're kind of just in this realm, in this bubble. You're still here. Um, and then if you do have a partner or if you don't telework, you come home and, you know, you do the commute, you come home, you may come home to no one. There, there, you may not have a partner. So that whole thing, I, I struggled with that as well because my partner wasn't here yet. Um, so I was kind of in the high plains by myself um, from the South. So I kind of just, it was, it was a hard struggle, um, just like transitioning from that. So I know, you know, juggling everything like that can be amazingly stressful. Just too much. So I've set like, this is my corner. This is where I will work in the office slash house of uh, NWS living room. So <laughs> that's kind of what I dealt with um, in a way. I don't know if I kind of helped that conversation flow, but I don't have a solution, but that's the way I've dealt with it. Yeah, and I think a lot of people can relate to that. It's been a challenging year and things do seem to bleed over into one, you know, home and, and work tend to, the lines are kind of merged in this weird weird place that we're in. Um, so I sh thank you for that. I think a lot of people can, can resonate with that. Um, Jennifer? So like Aisha, I also started a new job and moved during the height of the pandemic. So that was really probably one of the hardest beginnings of a new job that I've ever had. Um, as an MIC, you know, my policy was always to have kind of an open door, you know, people could come in and, and chat and visit and not having that ability with a new office and a new staff was really hard. Um, and I even really was not going into the office much at first. I was working from home and so one thing that I tried to do was begin going into the office and filling some shifts just so I could begin meeting people even one-on-one -on -one or, you know, a few people at a time and spending some time there and getting familiar with the office. Um, I think it's been probably difficult for my family because I do move around in the house. You know, um, my youngest son is a freshman at CU Boulder, and he's taking his classes in the dining room. He took my spot in the dining room, so I had to find a new spot. And um, I just 
tell people when I'm on a webinar and I don't want them like shouting or saying something in the background or walking behind me. So they have to work around me a little bit. I think that's a challenge for them. I think one of the things that, you know, as a society, when we come out of the pandemic, I think we're going to look back and wonder why we expected our productivity to remain exactly the same as if nothing was going on. Because, you know, at the same time we're working and we're working from home, we're concerned about family members that may get COVID or may be ill or have children that are struggling in school and we have to help them. And um, so I've tried to be you know, patient with myself and my family. And I hope that carries over to work and just give kind of that leeway and that understanding that everybody has loved ones that they're trying to take care of in whatever format that that is. Um, but it's interesting still that it seems like we're still punching that time clock and making sure that we're accountable for our hours. And that goes for me, but also the way I view the staff in my office, you know, I'm, I feel like we, as a culture, as a society, we probably could have done more to help people. And I'm not sure we did that. Yeah, thanks. And Karen? Well, a lot of, you know, what I was gonna say, Jennifer and Aisha have already kind of touched on a little bit, but one of the things that, you know, I felt like is that I had to be on all the time because there were days that when I was teleworking, um, you know, which in our schedule, those happened decently often in, you know, a maybe like a week stretch at a time, you know, every few weeks. Um, and especially when the pandemic first onset, you know, my kids were going to school, they were it was gonna be spring break and then all of a sudden they never went back to school. Um, my husband, thankfully, he works for the school system. So he was kind of home, you know, at least initially he was home and then he kind of transitioned back, but um, he could kind of take care of things. And so I relied on him for things that I didn't rely on him for before, just to take the load off of, of me. But there were times when I was teleworking and the kids would be here too. And I distinctly remember one time I tried to get them started on their schoolwork last year in the middle of a telework shift just because I thought they could handle it themselves, quickly figured out that was not the case. So I went from teleworking to, you know, immediately going to be teacher, getting that done, and then immediately going into kind of my normal household duties, you know fixing dinner, you know, getting them ready for bed, those sorts of things. And so I didn't feel like I could flip the switch off ever. Um, so one of the things that I quickly realized that needed to be done is that I needed to start getting creative and also prioritizing my own self-care because I needed to just be able to flip the switch off and just be me. Um, and so I had to get like I said, I had to get creative um, because my normal roots, like going to get a manicure, pedicure, were not happening. Going to get my hair done, not happening. Um, hanging out with my friends, not happening. Um, but self-care became increasingly important. And so don't skimp on that. Completely agree. We talk about in our office, we've talked about the commute time sometimes needing that time to transition, you know, because you're in the office and at least if I'm in the car driving home, I have time to switch my mind from work to home. Here, I open the door and the 10-year-old is right there and needs something. <laughs> so totally get that. Jamie? Wow. I want to echo pretty much everything I've heard so far. The The thing that I would add is what I'll call coping with loss. And the loss of productivity is one of them. Um, I don't like being my own IT person. <laughs> I, mean, I spend 
too much time trying to figure stuff out that I could just ask one of my geek friends down the hall, you know, that I used to do. That's one thing. Um, I am caring for aging parents. I lost my mother in December. And so a big part of my life has been kind of from crisis to crisis. Um, I've also lost physical fitness because my gym is closed. And that's an important part of self-care for me. Uh, I've got some substitutes, but I don't, they're not as good. But um, I think that I have come to a lot of acceptance of the losses because I've largely because I've been able to remain grateful in the pandemic that I'm one of the lucky ones, that I have the option to work from home, that I have supportive management that is even telling us don't expect to be as productive as you typically are. Be yeah, so I think uh, that has helped me with acceptance of what I personally have lost and what we as a culture have, have lost. Thank you for that. Um, and I'm sorry to hear about, hear about your parents. Um, so Rachel. So uh, uh, I also changed, transferred uh, right before COVID started. And uh, I was in the process of commencing uh, yet another geo batch tour, uh, meaning that my family was going to stay in one place and I was going to move somewhere else. Um, and so uh, having geo batch twice for my husband and then executed what I what my husband and I call single parent ops twice, uh, once while my husband was deployed when we lived in Japan and another time when he had the geo batch and I had the kids, um, I kind of knew what I was walking into. I knew what my my you know, my uh, what I needed to do for my work-life balance. And so COVID, you know, stuck a wrench in all that. Um, uh, my, the places I wanted to live all fell through. So I was jumping around trying to find a place to live while I was uh, taking on my, my new duties here. Um, my family was back in, in California. Uh, they, you know, went through the same pain that all the other panelists with kids, you know, you go on spring break and you never, you never come back from spring break. So <clears throat> um, it was a bit of a challenge. Uh, um, it was, it was also a challenge because uh, I was trying to execute um, this new position, which a lot of people, you know, didn't support, uh, but was very, very important um, to my community and to the Navy. And so my ability to uh, kind of build a team became very difficult during that time because the Navy required us to do uh, work where we would be seven days on, seven days off. Um, my team was off and gone uh, for seven days straight, and then I would have a new team on for the next seven days, and I was there all the time because I had to be there all the time. Uh, so that was our, our answer to social distancing. So uh, uh, that you know, prevented some challenges work-wise uh, for me to be able to, to you know, get uh, my position up and running, unfortunately. Um, but we worked through that. And then, uh, of course, um, once I started to go through the training process, once, uh, you know, we started to get ready to deploy, you know, we, we live on the ship. So COVID or no COVID, uh, I live at work 24 hours a day and seven days a week. So much like uh, everyone else here is now experiencing with having your phone and your computer right within arm's reach. And, and it's very, very tempting to go, oh, let me just check that. Let me do this one more thing. Um, this is this is what I live 24-7. I sleep literally within arm's reach of my phone in case my watch has to call me in the middle of the night. So I have to be on uh, constantly. So it makes it critical for me to find time for myself. So in order to address that, I strive to maintain a set schedule uh, that's not always possible, but I work really hard at it. Um, I make time to, you know, get outside and see the sunshine. Uh, you'd be surprised at being, you know, floating around in the ocean in this huge aircraft carrier that you'd be able to get out and see the sun. I've gone two weeks at a time without breathing fresh air. Uh, that's my fault. So I have to make sure that 
I get outside. Uh, I take some time for myself in the evening before I go to sleep and read a little bit, something that, that is not heavy, you know, dealing with my, my profession, something that will allow me to lift my mind. Um, and, of course, I, you know, the time to um, to talk with my family when I can, uh, keep up with their activities, uh, know what they're doing at school, you know, let them know, you know, that, that mom's still here, uh, which is which is really important, uh, especially, you know, my, my, my two are preteens. Actually, my daughter just turned 13 about a week ago. So, um, you know, that's, that's kind of how I've attacked it COVID-wise. Uh, I just added a little bit of element of difficulty to that. Uh, overall, but, um, uh, you know, you just, you, you, you keep having to work at it and it, it evolves constantly. So, um, that's, that's how I try to manage it. Thanks, Rachel. All right. So one more question for the panel before we go to questions from the audience. So if, again, just a reminder, if you could use the chat feature to put your questions in, I'll read those, uh, in a minute or two here. So um, the last focus question I have for all of you is, and Aisha, you touched on this a little bit earlier about um, just the lack of balance. Um, and I once read that there's no such thing as work-life balance, that sometimes work is just going to take all of you, and sometimes home is going to take all of you, and that the balance lies in making sure that one isn't always outweighing the other, but that there will be, there will be imbalance. Um, and so my question to the panel is, what do you do? Um, what do you do when balance isn't achievable? How do you manage that? So we'll start with Aisha again. Uh, so I kind of depend on other relationships to kind of fill that void if I'm not able to kind of balance properly. So if I'm, I'm not doing um, so hot, with like my personal personal balanced life, I kind of, hey, you want to go on a hike? You want to want to go like we have women wine nights um, sometimes. And I I really appreciate that because it's just a way to relax. Um, so so things like that really kind of helps me like fill the void of where if I'm not doing so hot here, then this kind of picks me up so that I can get back on that like course and keep going. So that's kind of how I deal with it. Thanks, Jennifer. So I think the biggest lesson I learned during my career was when I was a warning coordination meteorologist in Topeka, um, I just wanted to do everything. I wanted to be involved in everything. I wanted to work every severe weather event. I wanted to go four nights a week and do spotter training. I wanted to just be involved in everything. And um, I wish somebody had told me, you have permission to say no. You can say no and and it's okay. I wish somebody had told me that I could change the way I did my job, that I didn't have to have it be so um, all consuming because I did have younger kids at that time. Um, so basically I came to the conclusion after four years of the w being the WCM in that office with a lot of severe weather, I decided I either needed to change the way I did my job or change jobs. So I changed jobs. And, um, you know, it's hard to do that. It's hard to make that decision and it's hard to move your family again. But that's what we did. And um, I don't regret it because actually uh, being the MIC of an office is also difficult and very time consuming. But I was able to balance my time a little bit more and spend more time with my family. So um, I think if you find yourself in that situation, where you're not able to achieve some sort of balance where you are okay with it. You know, if it's nagging at you that you're not doing the best for your family or, you know, you're just running yourself into the ground because you're taking on so much, I think you really need to give yourself that permission to change the way you do your job, change jobs or say no. 
That's great advice. Karen? You kind of touched on this, um, Dr. Hawkins, but I wanted to just stress that the most important thing that you can do is prioritize in the moment what is most important. Because like you said, sometimes it's going to be work. Sometimes it's going to be, um, you know, your home life. And sometimes it's not really easy. I ran into a situation six years ago. We had a very active May where we had, I mean, massive flooding, severe weather and everything. And I distinctly remember it was Mother's Day. <laughs> and I was actively preparing for a 16 hour day at work. We had, luckily we had extra people, you know, in the office and I was totally focused on, okay, you know, severe weather, this is going to be what I do today. And four hours into the shift, I get a call from my husband letting me know that my daughter had an accident and she needed to go to the emergency room. And so I had to basically jump from something that was incredibly important to something in my home life that was more important in that moment. And there was a big part of me that did not feel good about that because I mean, you don't want to abandon the staff. You don't want to abandon the mission, you know, especially on a Sunday. Um, but luckily, my coworkers, you know, the lead on shift, he was like, go take care of it. Um, but, you know, it's not always easy to do that prioritization, but um, you you have to do that. And another thing that I do to make it easy um, is whenever possible, plan ahead if you can anticipate you know, when you might have that sort of imbalance. So what I mean by that is if you think that you might have a 16 hour day at work and, you know, the stuff that you might do in the evening, you know, to get ready for the next day, like, you know, packing the kids lunches or, you know, figuring out what clothes they need to wear or maybe doing an extra load of laundry. If you can anticipate those days, which again is not always, you know, feasible, but sometimes it is to, plan and take care of those things earlier than you might be able to because I'm the type of person that I'm a list maker and obviously I'm a planner <laughs> and so if you can you know if I have a lot of stuff on my list that's a weight on my shoulders and so if I can actively take that stuff off then I can just forget it and I can focus on the the mission at hand that's great advice. I, I am also a list maker. I have like four or five different apps on my phone just for making lists because checking those boxes feels so good. Um, okay, Jamie. <laughs> I, I really want to echo what Karen said. Um, your story is about as important as you get in terms of putting together that tension between work demands and home demands and having to do such a dramatic shift. I, I, I haven't graduated to electronic media. I live by little pieces of paper. So um, I think ironically, the pandemic and uh, has taught me to accept limitations better than I have before, um, meaning that my inbox is gonna blow up. I'm going to get a call and and as of now it's going to be about my father and there's a you know a situation that has to be dealt with um, and the rest has to fall away um, better acceptance of that my house is going to be cluttered and that um, I'm still okay I haven't had a haircut in a year I haven't been to my gym in a year but I'm still okay and it's been a an interesting life lesson has been, it still is. Yeah, thank you. I, I totally agree. Sometimes you just have to um, be accepting of, I think, disappointment because on one side or the other, there's going to be some disappointment. Um, and I think, as Jennifer was saying earlier, make sure you're taking care of yourself so that you can survive those moments as well and keep going forward. Um, but yeah, uh, Rachel. So um, a lot of really, really good advice uh, given. 
uh, you know, uh, I I would say everything that that I could add is, um, you know, my perspective. Um, after being in the maybe 26 years, um, you know, I recognize that in times like I'm currently in, um, work is my story. Um, I don't, I, I can't go home. Um, and that, <clears throat> that is, that is difficult, but I am blessed that I have uh, a very, very good support network at home. Um, my husband is fantastic. Uh, he works as well, but he, um, uh, you know, we've we've uh, we plan so that we have uh, a village uh, to help us out when we need it. So to the point of planning for those times, uh, planning ahead for those times when you know you you can't be there. Uh, there is uh, a safety net. There's a network. Um, there are plans put in place uh, to mitigate your absence. Um, but it is clear and that. Uh, you may not, I may not be able to be there in person, um, but I am there um, because I have made sure that uh, my, my family has what they need to get along without me for a short period of time. Um, and uh, so, you know, I can't, I'm not going to, don't beat myself up about it, but that's that's part and parcel with being in, in military service. Um, so, you know, sometimes there are going to be those challenges where you can't be there, but by all means, um, you know, it, you know, you, if you can, you need to know, it, no, not if you can, you need to know what your priorities are, and then you need to have a plan to execute them. Um, don't fault yourself. Uh, don't beat yourself up about it, uh, and remember that you cannot burn yourself out trying to do everything. Ask for help when you need to carry the load. Learn how to say no, like we, we've talked about it. These are all very, very important things to uh, to, to manage when that when that balance is achievable. Yes, all very good advice. All right, so we do have a few questions that have come in. Um, so this first one, out, anyone can take this one. Um, how do you balance shift work while also having a family that has a normal nine to five schedule? And how do you deal with missing important events because of your shift work? Who wants to take on that one? I guess I'll start with that. Um, very lucky in my office that um, people are very willing to swap shifts. So there have been very few events um, for my kids that I have been unable to attend. Now, neither one is in sports yet, and my daughter really wants to play bas basketball, and I know that I'm going to be missing, you know, some of those, and I'm just going to have to accept that because I'm not going to be able to, you know, switch every time. Um, but, you know, things like parent-teacher conferences, I've been able to schedule those around, you know, my schedule, maybe by, you know, taking off, 30 minutes at the end of a day shift or something to, to make the drive to their school. Um, so, you know, the ones that I can't make, I just kind of have to get over it. Um, again, prioritize, you know, if it's something that's really important, then, um, you know, maybe I'll, I'll take off for it. But if it's something that, you know, like a, a basketball game that may occur, you know, multiple times over a year, then maybe you know that's not going to be something that I'm going to actively try to um, take off or switch for. Um, I have kind of skimped on my own self care for important things. Um, I'm one of these people that I, I I can't do mids without a evening nap because I have stopped being able to sleep past noon after getting off one, so I have to split my sleep. Um, my daughter's kindergarten graduation, I had to completely skip that uh, evening nap so I could attend that. So there's, you know, sometimes you have to sacrifice things. And I guess that's one of those, you know, you just have to get over it in order to, you know, fulfill your job and attend what you can. Yeah, I can jump in too real quick. And when my children were babies and I was working rotating shifts all the time. I really enjoyed that because they weren't 
in daycare, you know, Monday through Friday. And I was able to spend whole days off with them at home and keep them in a routine. But it became much harder when they were in school. Because if I was working an evening shift, I would not see them. So one of the things that I started doing was splitting my sleep. So I would walk my oldest son to school, get up and walk with him to school. So I at least had a chance to see him. Then I'd go home and maybe get a little more sleep and then get up and go to work. And the same was true on midnight shifts. I was I would split my sleep, get up in the afternoon so I could make them dinner and pick them up from daycare because my husband was also working at that time. Um, in the past two offices and probably even the last three offices and probably others that I don't even remember, I know that we had an office culture that really swapped shifts with each other a lot to make things work. And then also the management team has been willing to help cover shifts. And then um, th I think that helps with some of those issues. Okay. Um, so we have a question that came in for Jamie. Um, on the topic of presenting your whole self, do you think that workplace culture is easier for men because for society as a whole, their wives usually are taking care of their non-work lives? Absolutely. And that is, I came into the agency, I was the first woman ever at, when I was a, a student trainee, uh, it, it, it was called the co-op program then. Um, Oh yeah, I mean, the, throughout my career, the um, the wives were taking care of everything else, and you know they might get phone calls um, from their wives, you know, as a consultant for something. <laughs> but I think that's why I'm so sensitive, and I feel badly for what I that I bought into this culture. But we're in a male-dominated field still, and um, women still tend to um, oversee the household more so than their partners. That's generalization. Forgive me for that part. But I have been really struck by how stuck we are in that model. And there are ways to change that that I believe are constructive. So modeling good behavior, so to speak. I hope that helps. That does help. And, and this next question gets at some of the, um, I'll just read it. So how do you deal with feelings of guilt and anxiety when things are out of balance and you feel you're not able to give your best to different aspects of your life, work, family, personal, et cetera? I, um, I, I really kind of, when you said guilt, I'm just like, that's, I think a cloak that working mothers, whether it's in meteorology or any other field, I mean, we just wear it constantly because you are missing some of those milestones or some of those important things. And I think, um, you know, it takes a long time to really forgive yourself, um, my mom always tells me, you know, what are you showing your sons that that women can do? And she she puts that spin on it. But it is I think it's something we have to kind of let go of a little bit and not feel as guilty about it if we can. I know it's probably easier said than done. Yeah. So um, we have about five more minutes. I'm going to try to get through some of See if we can get through these. So um, how do you explain to supervisors that at times you may not want to climb the ladder and apply for the promotion because where you're at currently is helping you balance your home and work balance with starting a young family at home? You hate to disappoint them when they want to see you grow in your career, though. Anyone have experience pushing back in that kind of way? Um, I have experience pushing back, but not necessarily a promotion. 
um, there are times where there are opportunities that kind of uh, like my upper level management wants me to grow, um, wants me to do more. Um, and there are times that I choose not to because there are times where I know I'm gonna get pushback from others seeing me do those things and and kind of go, well, why is she always the one doing this? Why is she always trying to be this shining example, this shining star? She's always trying to outreach and do all these things. So there are times that I have been guilty of going, I don't need to do this opportunity because I know someone's going to say something and it's going to leave me in this like this li negative limelight um so it's kind of hard when you're like early career and you want to do more but then it's just hard to find the balance and i don't want to stick out because i already am sticking out <laughs> um so that may be way too honest for this conversation but um that that's an example. I don't think that's too honest for this conversation no. at all. And and I would encourage, you know, you and, and anyone else, if if you're interested in opportunities and um, you know, you're you're willing to do that, go for it. Um, and the people who have something to say about it will likely be left behind. But that's just me. <laughs> I think Rachel, you were gonna jump in. <laughs> Yeah, so um, you know, it, th there is a stigma behind it. Um, you you are in a male-dominated field. I am certainly in a male-dominated field, um, and you know, you you want to find that time, uh, you know, to to be able to start a family that will fit in with your with your career path. Um, the Navy did a really awesome thing a few years back and instituted something called the Career Intermission Program, and they made it available to men and women in the Navy um, where you could take one to two years off uh, when you wanted. And when you came back, you could use that for education. You could use it to go find yourself. You could use it to start a family. You could use it to how you what you wanted to do with it. Um, and you were welcomed back into the Navy, and those two years just disappeared. So it was like you never left. Your what we use for our, our seniority starts with a year group. So your year group just shifted two years, um, and that was a great way for us to be able to retain talent, avoid that stigma, uh, and and um, you know give people the opportunity to 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 do something personal, achieve achieve something that they want to do you know in their life, like start a family. Um, I actually had a very a very opposite experience uh, when I was pregnant with my first child. The admiral that I worked for brought me in and said, "Hey, Rachel, um, you know, you're you're getting ready to go to sea next. You know, it's really easy for me to to help you find a job just so you can you know go take care of your family." And a little bit of the opposite of what we're talking about here. I said, uh, "You know, no, sir. I I want to go to sea. I need to go to sea." Um, this is this is a milestone in my career, and and this is this is my plan. Uh, and I was very taken aback uh, because I know that 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 admiral would not have offered that same opportunity to um, a, a male counterpart. And I was very upset about that uh, for a while. But that was the that was the environment I lived at at the lived in in the time. Um, and so it, at any rate, what I would say is yes, there is there is. You know, there's stigmas out there, and no matter where uh, or what community you're in, uh, but look for the opportunities. And and if the opportunities aren't there, you know, use examples and say, hey, this is this is what this organization is doing. Can it can it be applied in in what we do uh, to help retain talent? Wow, that sounds like an awesome program. Um, <laughs> that's great. So we are we're at one o'clock. Um, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So we're going to finish it here. Um, so again, thank you all. Thank you to the panelists for sharing your your thoughts and suggestions and advice um, and experiences with everyone today. I know I took away some valuable lessons and I'm sure 
everyone in the audience did as well. Uh, again, thank you to um, the AMS um, Board for Operational Government Meteorologists right, for hosting this, um, this panel um, and providing a space for this important discussion. And um, uh, that's, that's all for today. So thank you all.